can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Faison Syed of EastRiverDigital.com. Faison, before I formally introduce you, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. Um, I had, since this is part of the Top Agency series, we're going to talk uh, about culture. We're going to talk about work from home. We're going to talk about the uh, value-based pricing um, and all of that. But um, I had Jason Swank on. Um, we were talking a little bit about him before we hit record here. He grew his agencies to over eight figures, sold it, and then started another group. Uh, his One of his other groups, he runs a mastermind for agencies. And the other one, he is buying up agencies. And it's really interesting. He talks about how he values them, how they're buying them, how he structures it. Uh, Todd Tasky also, um, his episode was really good. He runs the Second Bite podcast and he calls it the Second Bite because he matches private equity companies with agencies and sells them. But then when the private equity sells, sometimes those owners make more on the Second Bite than they did on the first. So again, uh, talking about valuation and the landscape as well. And another favorite episode is I added a D. Clevett. You know, um, actually, Faison and I went to the Cubs game together and a D, um, we were talking about software and tools and all that. And a D and I just talked about, we geeked out on our favorite productivity tools, software, what we use for our business. And so that was a really good one where we laid out the different tools and software we use. Uh, we'll hear a little bit about what you use. But before we get to it, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the strategy, the accountability, and the full execution and production. Uh, you know, phase on, we call ourselves the magic elves that work in the background to make sure everything works, make it look easy for the company and the host. You know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you thought about podcasting, you should. Based on actually has a podcast and pretty popular, which we'll talk about. Um, and you should, right? Go to rise25.com or email us at support at rise25.com. And um, without further ado, uh, Faison Syed is founder and CEO of East River Digital. You can check it out at eastriverdigital.com. Uh, they're an award-winning full-service digital marketing agency with a global footprint of clients. They serve all sorts of sectors. They have healthcare, beauty, confectionery, pharma, technology, beverage, real estate, financial services. Um, and past clients include companies and products like Oreo, Cadbury, Unilever, Pizza Hut, and many, many more. He's I guess a former investment banker and business analyst from GM turned digital marketer entrepreneur. So Faison, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. It was a great Cubs game that day. Yeah, ex exactly. It's a great way to spend uh, Chicago, a day in Chicago. Can you just start off, tell people about East River Digital and what you do? Sure. So East River Digital is a full service agency. Um, we service clients, like you said, across all sectors. Uh, we believe in being able to deliver audiences and then convert audiences as per the needs of the client. We work throughout the, we take a full funnel approach all the way from awareness down to conversion and retargeting. And our entire team is in-house uh, and full-time. So we have a staff of about uh, about 100 people and that serves clients across the US, UK, uh, you know, Middle East, and maybe we've even experimented in Australia. You know, um, you have a really interesting background and, um, you know, University of Virginia, then you went on to get your MBA at Cornell, you worked for GM, you did uh, investment banking stints. I'd love to hear what you learned at GM that you now bring into to your business now. Sure. So I think it took me a while to realize what my friends had been saying all along, is that I'm not a finance guy, I'm a marketeer. And I didn't believe them for the longest time because the perception always was that the investment banking career path is the way to go. Um, 
investment banking or consulting. You know, no one really talked about marketing in the undergrad days. So it was only that I had to pursue that and discover that, you know what, they were probably right. I should be in marketing. And, um, you know, that's how the agency came about. And within the agency, one of the core values for me, when we were setting up our core values, you know, we were like, what, what would be our core values? And our teams kind of came up with what they saw and observed over a two-year period. We didn't assign core values at the beginning. It was after two years, we said, okay, how are we behaving, operating? Because that's how, what we want to be. And our teams came up with continuous improvement. And I said, wait a second. I learned about Kaizen at General Motors. And Kaizen is the right way. It is the Japanese uh, word for continuous improvement that is deployed in manufacturing environments. I think it was started with Toyota. And so it is part of our core values. Our core values are Kiku, C-I-I-K-O-O. It's easy to remember. Creative, innovative, interactive. That's how we view our clients' work. And then Kaizen, organized and ownership. That is how we view our internal work. So for me, what I took away from GM was Kaizen. Always be improving. So what made you start? If I look at your career trajectory, I wouldn't think he's going to start an agency, right? I'm thinking he's a successful marketing analyst. He worked for General Motors. He goes on. He's in investment banking. What made you decide to start your own company? It's funny. I... I did GM because I had a passion for cars. I still do. I'm a big car guy. I love, you know, working on vehicles. I love restoring old cars. I'll, you know, enter the occasional desert rally where I live. Um, you know, I've been done the drag racing thing and everything. So cars have been a big part of my life. That's why I wanted to work at GM. When I worked at GM for four years, I worked across manufacturing in Louisiana, New Jersey, Michigan. Then I moved into marketing and strategy, and I was on their emerging leader track. But I realized that as much as I love cars, I love cars for me, not as a career, you know? So that whole thing about wanting to do investment banking, that's just something I grew up with in the environment we were in. And so I was like, you know what? All right, let's try the banking thing. I went, got my MBA, studied finance, and I got a gig at Lehman Brothers. Now, sometimes the universe gets together to let you know that this is not the right career path for you. And for that, Lehman Brothers had to dissolve, but I persevered. And when Barclays bought out Lehman, I continued on. And I was fortunate to have worked in their automotive group. And I ended up working on the General Motors IPO post-GM bankruptcy. So it was really interesting for it to come full circle. But when I was doing investment banking, I realized, I said, hey, wait a second. I'm happy putting in all these hours. I'm working on the auto sector. I like that. Great. But why am I doing this for someone else? I should be doing this for me. Now, at that point in time, I decided to move back. I grew up in Pakistan and I finished my high school in Pakistan. I moved to the US for college. I decided to move back. My wife had finished her residency. I was like, listen, if we get stuck in New York and I continue banking, you're a doctor. These are like golden handcuffs you can never let go of. So this is an opportunity where we, you finished your residency, you finished your uh, time. I finished a few years in banking. Now is a good time for us to go experiment with entrepreneurship if it works great. If it doesn't, we can always come back. And so I went back knowing entrepreneurship was the path, but not knowing where I'm going to end up. And I got involved in launching a TV channel and knew nothing about media. And I got involved launching a TV channel that was focused on health and lifestyle. And as I learned- That's TV the HTV. That was the HTV, exactly. It was health TV. Then we moved it and made it about HTV and health and, uh, health and lifestyle. We were featured by the BBC. Uh, they ran a global story on us that how we're actually the only health channel with a specific to show talking about sexual health in Pakistan. In fact, that was the only kind of show in the entire region, Middle East, South Asia, and so on. But when I realized the power of digital was growing, 3G, 4G services had not entered Pakistan till 2014. They'd entered the US, I think it was in 2008, eight nine. So Pakistan was a little bit behind. And I said, you know what? When 3G, 4G comes in, social is going to blow up. So we need to have a digital presence for our TV assets. When we built the digital presence for our TV assets, they grew faster than the TV audience did. And so when my friends saw that the digital was performing really well, they're like, oh, you really know this space. You know what? Can you help us out? And two of my friends, one owned a pharma company, said, help us with our digital presence. I said, okay, sure. I'll get my TV team to do it. 
And then another friend owned a logistics company, helped him out too. And then a third friend came knocking and said, hey, listen, we have this confectionery business. We're not happy with our digital agency. Can you take our business? I said, but I, I'm not an agency owner. I don't have an agency. I'm running a TV channel. There's a small team that services our digital presence. I can help do something with that. He said, you know what? All right, why don't you pitch for the business? I said, okay, we'll pitch for the business. So coincidentally, at the very same time, another friend of mine who was the local publicist affiliate in Pakistan came to me and said, hey, listen, so I'd helped him recruit some friends of mine, some good quality talent. He was looking for good people and I'd helped him recruit them. And he came to me and he said, listen, that one guy I hired, yeah, that team that he's leading, I need to let that team go because I don't think I want to be in that business of creative and digital where you're going to stick to our traditional for now. And I said, okay, you're going to let him and the whole team go? He said, yes. I said, wait, you know what? Pause one second. What's in that team? They're like designers, creatives, so a couple of media guys, and he's leading the team. I said, you know what? Don't let them go just yet. Can I borrow that team for a week? So I went to the team lead. He's a friend of mine. I said, listen, we've got this potential business. You guys are about to be let go. Why don't we go pitch for it? If you win, I'm going to absorb the whole team. And so we went, we pitched, and we won. Now, what was the business? The business was Mondelez in Pakistan. And Mondelez had the rights for Oreo, Duck, and Prince, which are three global biscuit brands. And they had six other local brands. So we had nine brands of biscuits, cookies, and so on, that suddenly we won the portfolio off. I had no knowledge of how to run an agency. I had no idea of what an agency structure looks like. And I suddenly had this one team that was being let go that I inherited. And I didn't have the funds to pay for this team. So I told my friend who was the publicist uh, affiliate owner, he said, I told him, I said, look, I'll take everything. I'll take their laptops, their desks, their rental lease. I'll take everything over, but I have no money to pay you for any of this. In fact, can you pay for their salaries as well for the next? <laughs> it's a great uh, pitch. <laughs> and that would be great. In turn, I will work for you, white label, for as long as you want to pay down this debt. We continued for the next three years working for them, white labeling, to pay down that debt. And we grew from a team of, I think it was about 12 or 13 people to about 100 people today, seven years later. And I think I've learned a little bit of how an agency works. That's fascinating. I love to hear, you know, it's it's oftentimes with these agency stories, it's the accidental agency. Uh, first of all, I just want to point out, I love how you kind of knew yourself with the conversation with your wife, because you could totally see she gets a great job at yeah. a hospital in New York. You're never leaving at that point. You know, yeah. it was a point in time where if you don't pay attention to those things, it could easily go down that that path, right? Yeah. Um, and the the really innovative way you structured that, there was a win win on both sides uh, for <clears throat> that person with their team and you. And I remember when I did some interviews at the Sweets and Snack Show, I never heard of Mondelez uh, before, but they own like everything. I mean, it's it's crazy how how big of a company that is globally. Um, and one thing I wanted to talk about is charging. At the time, you've you have a lot of experience in the business world, in a leadership world, but how did you decide to charge um, for you know you had friends in pharma logistics um, early on? What did you do? How are you thinking about pricing? I, you know what, that was my Achilles heel. I had no idea how to think about pricing. I did, I literally didn't. And I think what, and so the first few years, I literally was pricing based on what the market was pricing at, right? So to win business, we'd be like, okay, the market's pricing at just figuratively. If a market price is something at a thousand dollars, I'd be like, we'll do it for 900. Just bring the business here, you know? Now, what I didn't realize that most of the people in the market, because digital was a new space, most of the people in the market did not know how they were pricing either. Right? So not <laughs> the blind leading the blind. Literally, it was a collection of everyone kind of outbidding everyone without really thinking about how do we price this thing. And so I saw the business increase, but I was like, my profitability is not there. Like I'm always stuck in a cash flow jam. Like what what's going on? And so finally, the 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 banker, the math 
finance guy in me was like, wait a second, wait a second. You know, we're, we're not thinking about this correctly. And right when I said that, COVID happened. You know, so it took us a few years to build that scale, build the clients, and realize that, you know what, money's coming in, but we have a cash flow challenge. And then you get hit with COVID. Now you have more than a cash flow challenge. You know, you have a client challenge, you have an employee challenge, plus you have the cash flow challenge. And I think that's when I got the greatest experience of my life. I think COVID was an eye opener for a lot of us in a lot of different ways. And I think that I was very, very fortunate to have 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 experienced that period while I was living in Pakistan with family support. Um, you know, so at least the kids had a place to kind of roam around. I had space to get the work done and so on. Because I know how challenging it was for families here in the U.S without that kind of support system. And I found another support in the entrepreneurs organization of which you and I are both a member. And the support was in the form of the members. And I'll, give, and I'll tell you what that means. So for the first, I, I'd been a member eight years at that time and I'd been involved in the chapter in the region. So I knew what it had to offer, but I never really took its offerings for granted. Uh, I took its offerings for granted, never really leveraged them. I finally went into the website and I said, you know what? There's got to be other members who have agencies who are going through COVID and who are experiencing similar pain that I am and who have had a, a, a process of scaling their agency, cash flow issues. I'd love to hear from them. I went through, it took me a couple of days to find a hundred names. I would send out a hundred emails of the hundred. Most of them were in the US of the hundred. I got responses from and set up meetings with 40. And in the subsequent two months, I ended up making about 70 pages of Microsoft Word notes, all of which focused on costing, structuring, pricing, and how everyone did that differently. And that completely changed the way I thought about pricing and margins. And ever since then, my, I have two, literally at the, end of the, at the start of the year, I tell my team, I said, we have two goals for the year. NPS and EBITDA. Just remember these two words. If we have happy clients who are recommending us to other people and we are profitable, we will always be okay. And so the pricing, I think, was a big part of that. And so now we review clients, we review profitability, and we will decide, you know what? This is not a profitable client, but it's a big enough headline that it's worth it in terms of, let's say, a marketing play. Or if this is not a profitable client and it's not a big headline, why are we doing this? So I had no idea. EO members and their feedback helped me understand it. And now we're constantly thinking in terms of, you know, FTEs. We're thinking in terms of, you know, cost per hours. We're thinking in terms of overheads, you know. And so, and, and that mindset has now shifted down to every person in the agency because we compensate and we give out bonuses based on profitability to our team leads. I want to talk about some of those takeaways. Um, I know you don't remember the 70 pages in full, but I'd love to talk about what were some of the takeaways from those conversations of the cost structuring pricing. But we, before we get to that, is that, I want to know, how did you discover EO? Um, when I got into launching that TV channel, friend of mine in in and I just relocated to Karachi. So even though I grew up in Karachi, Pakistan, again, this is not the capital, but it's the biggest city in the country. That's about 25 million people. It's a huge city. It's like New York City, but in that part of the world, uh, with a whole different set of challenges. Um, even though I grew up there, I came back as an outsider and everyone looked at me as an outsider. They're like, oh, he's not from here, even though I'm from there. You know, because they're like, oh, you've spent 12 years in America, you have no idea how business is done here. So as I was navigating through that, I realized that they were right. I had no idea how business is done there. And what I've learned in America over 12 years, I need to throw out the door. And I was struggling with that concept. And so a friend of mine is like, look, you're now a co-founder in this business. The business is of a certain scale. You need to join EO because you will learn through the forum how people navigate through personal work and family challenges. And this is, a, this is going to be the best way for you to learn and network and get to know people and so on. And so he kind of pushed me into it. 
and the rest is history. What did you have to throw out the door? We'll talk about some of the differences Everything. between the U.S. and Karachi or in Pakistan. So I, I, I wouldn't say it's specific. I would say it's the Western world versus the Eastern world, right? So there's certain principal business differences. And then within the Eastern, Eastern markets, developing versus slightly more developed, right? So let's say Saudi is a more developed market in terms of GDP per capita, if you look at the numbers, right? So GDP per capita in Saudi is, let's say, north of $30,000. Pakistan and Egypt are about, Pakistan is about $1,500. Egypt is, let's say, about $2,800, right? So it's a big difference. Some behaviors are the same in Saudi, Egypt, and Pakistan, and India, but some behaviors are completely different in a market with a very low GDP per capita, right? So for example, what is the same? The same is people love holidays. There's a lot of downtime, right? There's just, and you're not used to that, you know, living in North America where everyone's gung-ho, gung-ho all the time. There's brief periods of slowness, like the summer or let's say the winter holiday season. But otherwise, it's always on, right? An 8 a.m. call will start at 8 a.m. Over there, an 8 a.m. call is a suggestion, right? If someone says they're going to be in your office at 9 a.m., then they're not going to be in your office at 9. If you're in Egypt, they'll show up at 10 and they're early. If you're in Pakistan, if they show up at 9.45, they're early, right? Saudi, Riyadh, Jeddah, so it's funny, Saudi, Riyadh, 9 a.m. means 9 a.m., but Jeddah, 9 a.m. means about 9.30, 9.45. So now it's just these small differences, right? How people value other people's time. That was the first big lesson. Holidays. Uh, number three is prioritize work is always a second priority for most people. It's not the number one priority, right? So how do you motivate people differently to make it a number one priority? In the Pakistan market or any price sensitive or any market with low GDP per capita, pricing is the number one driver. It's not service quality. It's not service delivery. It is pricing, right? So you have to solve for pricing. Um, and so you suddenly start looking at, okay, you know what, service quality, if no one's looking at, and if everyone's solving for price, then are we really commoditized? Are we a commoditized service? And if we're a commoditized service, are we being measured against the same parameters? But that's not the case either. So then the fourth thing is relationship. Relationship is everything. There's a Arabic word for it, wasta. Wasta means my connection, right? That is big. If you come with the right connect, if you come with the right reference, you're, you don't have a foot in the door. You basically shut the door behind you, right? So that's a big one. It's sometimes merit will be put aside if the wasta is right, because the person bringing you on board is saying, you know what? I know I can hold him accountable because he's my friend's friend. And that's way more valuable to me than the fact that they won 10 FEs and whatever. You know, so these are just some of the differences, I think. And oh, yes, the client expects you to always be on. And when I say always be on, I mean, I understand that's in all markets. And I understand I came from a banking background and, you know, that was a given. But here, always on means midnight, 11 p.m., 1 a.m. If the client's up, you better be up. There's no concept of, you know what, I'm, I understand that you have a life at home. So these are just some of the differences I observe. Talk about motivating people, right? You said work is a second priority. What are some of the things that you do with your team? And then we'll get to the, I want to get from the work from home versus in the office discussion, but um, you mentioned it's a really important on thinking about motivating people because it's really a second priority. Um, what are some of the things that you think about and do? When it comes to that, so motivating. Look, it, it's. I'll give you a current example. Over the last twelve months, the Pakistan market has become extremely, um, I would say, extremely interesting in terms of pricing. So, if anyone's looking for a delivery center, an offshore delivery center, I think there is no better market than Pakistan right now because. Yes. It's experienced 60% currency devaluation, but at the same time, it's not experienced a 60% increase in salaries, right? Which means the market is 
very price um, effective at this point, which also means that everyone in the market is extremely salary sensitive, right? So if they see a 5% increase, a 10% increase in salary, they will jump. So how do you keep them motivated to stay on your team? It's very hard. Because if a person comes and says, you know what, my costs have gone up 60%, but my wages have only gone up 20, I need to make up the differential of 40%, and I'm not able to afford to pay for my kids' schooling or my parents' health and education, you, you have nothing left for them to say, right? Because they are unable to meet their day-to-day -day expenses. So even if you wanted to motivate them, even if they are aligned with your vision and they think this is the best place to work, they are unable to sustain their life. Right. So you you have to let them go. Is what I've realized. Let them go, let them experience that work environment. And they are willing to put up with greater challenges in a work environment as long as the compensation is met. Now, what you do is the best talent, you stay in touch with them. Because at some point in time, they will either recognize that you know what, there is a cost differential, and I'm willing to pay that difference for a better work environment, something I'm much more passionate about. And we as a business, hopefully over that time, are able to upscale enough that we can afford that new salary structure of theirs. And so you leave that door open with them so that they can come back. That way you're not really losing the person forever. You're momentarily allowing them to shift to solve their life issues and then potentially come back if they need to when things are a little bit more stable for them and for you as a business, you can afford them. So that I find is one way. The other thing is training. We're big on training. We're huge on training. We're doing training constantly. We're upskilling and upscaling people. And I think one of the biggest motivating factors is, I mean, I consider our East River to be um, a training ground or let's say a, a university for people who want to move from a digital career onto a multinational. I think we have the highest number of people coming out of a digital agency going to Unilever in Pakistan. You know, so for me, that is, you know, a sort of a, you know, let's say a, a star on a, it's a badge for us because we're doing something right that a global multinational feels that our talent is suitable for them. And we use that as a tool for recruiting, saying that, hey, listen, come on board. If a couple of years later, this is not the place for you, look at where our people have exited and gone. So it's a great onboarding tool and it's a great motivating tool for people in the company because they're like, you know what, if I work hard enough here, I will definitely be uh, recruited by, you know, global multinational. We have people at TikTok, we have people at Meta, uh, Google and so on. Talk about your thoughts on work from home versus the office. And I know that your thoughts have flip-flopped and they go back and forth. Uh, from what before it's, till now? It's been it's been a struggle. I've always been a proponent of measuring outcomes based on success rather than, so for us, pay for success, don't pay us for the hours. And similarly, I want to think of that with my teams. You know what? We're paying you something. We're paying for a salary. Here's what we need solved. Now, you want to get this done in one hour. You want to get this done in 10. You want to get this done at home, in a coffee shop, or in the office. Honestly, we don't care. Now, in theory, that makes sense. But when you layer in the following factors in a developing market, so for example, um, homes are smaller. Most people live in joint family homes. So there's always, there's parents around, there's kids around. There might be even a brother and his kids around, right? So now how do you have a quiet space to get work done, right? Where you can deliver success. Then secondly, we have a lot of uh, power outages, right? Some neighborhoods have more power outages than other neighborhoods. Does the team member live in a neighborhood with a lot of power outages or not? If so, do they have backup power? If not, then what do you do? Because every time you're on a call and if there's an outage and there's no backup power, you're just not able to deliver that service quality, right? The third thing is, fine, you have no power outages. You live, uh, most people don't live alone. Um, you live in an environment where you can get the, this time and space. Are you able to maintain a good schedule? Because our market is a slightly late starting market, right? So 
people come in the digital space or in the agency space, people going getting to work is between 10 and 11. The time an agency or any agency is at its full swing is post noon, you know, staying on till let's say post 8 p.m. So if you're having early morning client calls and you're home, are you going to make that call? Are you going to be available in case you didn't make that call and answer your phone so that you actually jump on the call? Right. So we went back and forth um, on this. And then, of course, if you're working from home and a client calls you in and says, hey, listen, not Zoom. I need you in. Come to meet me. Are you going to be able to take that ride across to meet them? Because transport got expensive. Fuel prices increased. They doubled in the last year, year and a half. And so now everyone thinks twice before they get on to, you know, their own private transport to get around. So all of these things factor in, which make work from home extremely variable and makes work from home a concept that is never going to give you the same return that it does in a developed market. So can work from home work in a developing market? MIME, at, at this point, we ran it for three years. Tuesdays and Thursdays were fixed work from home. Don't come in. We still had half the office coming in. Why? Because of the reasons I mentioned. They thought that they were better off coming into the office. And finally, there was one big reason. Some people just wanted to get out of the house and not be stuck at home with their joint families. They just needed a place to get away. And so they preferred coming in. So keeping all these factors in mind, just two weeks ago, we shut down work from home and said, you know what? We're done. We're not doing it. This is a uh, you know on-seat gig. You need to be here to deliver service. And that's how we're going to take it forward. And if we're down the road, going to consider it only if we can tackle some of the variables. Person lives alone, doesn't have power outages. We can provide them transportation. And if we can take away the variables, then fine, we might consider another work from home model. But for now, we're not. Yeah. It sounds like, though, the uh, the staff, a, a lot of that was, <clears throat> I mean, I'm going to say fully driven by the staff, but they totally, they were on board with that. They wanted that and they were yearning for that. Um, and it, it seemed like not an easy choice, but people are, all, all things pointed to let's just, just come in the office, right? At that point. Yeah. Um, I'd love to to talk a little more about what you do as a company. And you did some really cool work. We, we mentioned Mondelez and Oreo. Um, what are some of the things you did there? So one of the things we're most proud of is right when we started off as an agency, we had a strong creative dream. My uh, head of business development who helped me kick off this business, his name was Shehan. Uh, his name is Shehan. He went on to a uh, delivery hero to one of their local uh, companies that they bought uh, just a year ago. But um, you know, he built a fantastic creative team even at the onset. And we did a project for Oreo called, and we call it Storio. And what we did is we took the Oreo cookie, animated it in 3D, and made th four different characters, right? And so the story premise was Oreo cookies save a kid's day. And season one was how the kid left his lunchbox behind um, on his way to school, and the cookies kind of jumped out of the lunchbox and helped walk that lunchbox all the way to school, you know? So it was, a, it was like a Toy Story meets um, Oreo animation. And it did really well. We ended up doing about two seasons of it until Oreo said, you know, we cannot animate characters. It was so well received that we got published as an agency in Oreo's global newsletter that went to all of its uh, global affiliates around the world. And that was a great win for us and a great achievement within our first year as an agency. Um, another thing that we did for Pizza Hut was Pizza Hut struggled with its return on ad spend. And, you know, they were doing about a ROAS of about 4X and they came to us and said, look, you need to double this for us. And that's a minimum requirement. And so I sat with the team, we did some brainstorming, came back to them and said, you know what, it will double it for you. But if we take it above that, is there a bonus or an incentive for us? They're like, oh, we've, no agency's ever asked for that. I was like, okay, we want a bonus or an incentive if it's above double. If it's below double, fine. This is the retainer. Above double, we want... Let's say if we hit anything above eight, we want this. If we hit anything above 10, we want this. If we hit anything above 12X, we want this. So I think they kind of laughed it off. They're like, yeah, yeah, sure. Put in the contract. Great. We averaged 11 as a return on ad spend, you know, frequently hitting above 12. And I just, 
you know, thought that the way we tackled it and the, the way the team took this assignment on, I think it even blew away the client. And sometimes when you leave the client speechless, it's a lot of fun because they don't expect to see that kind of return. And it's a win-win for both, right? They're making money, they're selling more pizzas and we're making a bonus. So that was a, that was a big win for us um, on the media side. One on the SEO side, again, this was learning for me, right? I, I didn't know. I didn't know the power of SEO. We had an SEO team. And I oftentimes like clients was like, yeah, it's just okay. You're optimizing words. Like what, what value is there, right? I get it. You're going to appear at top of the searches, but quantify that value for me, please. We did SEO work for Dolens, which is basically the general electric for home appliances. It's a Turkish company um, that uh, runs operations in that market. And in a 12 month period, we increased organic traffic and sales on the website by over 100% just because of SEO. And I saw the tangible impact that running an effective SEO campaign had on an electronics manufacturer. And I was like, wow, I had no idea that SEO can be more uh, promising than paid media. Plus it's more cost effective because your retainer is lower than paid media and you're not spending media money and it's all organic traffic coming from search. So I thought that was that was a learning for me, right? I mean, obviously we delivered to the client, but I learned something from that and I learned about SEO there. And finally, I think the most interesting one was when um, in 2020 October, we so we do we do PR as well, corporate PR, and um, we provide that service to our clients. In 2020 October, Emmanuel Macron, the French president at the time, went on and made a negative statement about Muslims around the world. And so what happened in the Pakistan market is that retailers started banning the sale of French products, which includes L'Oreal, which includes our brand Lou. So Lou was uh, basically the name of the brand the Mondelez had acquired. It was originally a French brand um, and was selling biscuits, basically the nine brands that were talked about. And everyone know, know, knew them as Lou in our local market. 70% sale decline in one month. That was a huge hit for them. And so I personally had to go to religious scholars, show them this is not a French company, this is American. I was like, I realize I'm creating a problem for later on, <laughs> but at least it's solving this one now. <laughs> but, um, they're not French, they're American. Can you please create short shorts and reels talking about how this ban is wrong and it's affecting workers working in the country it is affecting revenue generation, tax generation, and please create those reels and let's share them with your communities. We got these religious leaders to create reels. We posted them on their Facebook groups. We amplified those reels. We wrote articles in newspapers, and then we created an ad, the first campaign that TikTok ran in the country about how this is an American company employing thousands of people, generating millions in taxes, and that this should not happen. We reversed the sale decline of 70% down to 10% within two months. So it was a huge win for us. And again, I'd never done something like this before. So, you know, it was, uh, it was an achievement. You there. have to think on your feet with that one. Oh my God, it was, a, it was unbelievable. Um, what about with Coach? Do some work coach, with Coach. Coach in Saudi. So we've just picked that up in Saudi and that is giving us access into the Saudi market. And now what's interesting in the Saudi market is it behaves completely differently. You would think that Facebook is big everywhere, but not in Saudi. 30 million is their pop, 33 million, let's say roughly is their population. 99%, 98% is data and 4G penetration. And roughly the same number of, let's say, TikTok's about, let's say, 28 million ballpark users of TikTok. Snap is about between 25, 28. Facebook is less than 12 million, meta. So Facebook advertising does not work there. You have to be on Snap and you have to be on TikTok. And so what we're learning is that because you have to be on Snap and TikTok, you will run campaigns on them. But when you run campaigns on TikTok, you suddenly a lot of, see a lot of bot traffic coming out of Singapore and different markets, right? So it's extremely challenging for us to figure out what the right platform is because yes, there is a lot of users on these two platforms, but advertising on those two platforms does not yield the kind of results or traffic that is, is, is authentic traffic that yields conversions. 
So we're kind of learning through this process because in other markets, it's Insta, it's so it's Meta, Insta and Facebook, it's Google. Here, this is a challenge. Which platform gives you the best audience? We're and, and again, the funny thing is the local market, I went, explored Riyadh and Jeddah. The top digital marketeers were like, there are no experts in digital marketing in this market. So if you guys are talking like this, you're the only ones talking like this. For me, that was a learning that I was like, wow, there's this is such a huge market, such a huge opportunity. There's no top experts here. Unbelievable. And the second thing, language, Arabic, searches in Arabic, optimization in Arabic. English does not work as effectively as Arabic. So English works on certain things, but not on other things. And so taking all of these learnings, sifting through them and applying them, I think is is something that's really, really interesting for us at this point in time, because that market is going to explode in the next five years, just the way they are positioning themselves, the way they are scaling. I mean, that is going to be the hub of all economic activity in the region in the next five to 10 years. Bazan, first of all, thank you. Thanks for sharing your journey. It's pretty remarkable. And I have one last question um, before I ask it. Um, I want to point people to check out eastriverdigital.com to learn more. Um, you also have a podcast that people can check out um, on YouTube, uh, Digitales, D-I-G-I Tales, um, where you have some notable people in the region that you featured. So people can check that out as well. Um, uh, I'd love to hear your favorite resources. Uh, it could be books. It could be podcasts. It could be um, audio books. It could be software. What are your favorite resources that you go to and recommend to other um, business owners? So I love this question and I'm totally borrowing it for my podcast. <laughs> um, I think for me, I discovered Audible in COVID and I haven't looked back. I was never a book reader just because I could never finish a book and it was really annoying for me. Um, and I've discovered that Audible makes it a lot easier for me to consume the content. Um, and I'm able to finish one book a month now. And it's been fantastic for me. Um, in terms of resources. The Are there favorite I... Audible books that you'd recommend? Yes. I So I really enjoyed this book I discovered. It's called The Book of Joy. It's a conversation between Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. And it talks about the barriers to joy in a person's life and how to, and then it overcomes and how you overcome those barriers. And then it talks about, um, you know, attaining a state of joy and happiness and how to stay in that state. And I think that's a great book. It's a great read. And you can read it chapter by chapter. You can read the whole thing. Um, I highly recommend that. Yeah. Uh, I also read um, The Surrender Experiment. Uh, this is a book, um, by singer, Michael Singer, if I got it right, right. He had the untethered soul, which is his first, but surrender experiment was his second book. And the reason this book was interesting is because here is a guy who was very inward driven about meditation, happiness, who ended up building a billion dollar company, his journey in building that company, and then almost losing all of it when he sold it to WebMD. And I think it's a great story for a lot of us entrepreneurs who you know, go through these ups and downs and to recognize how do you manage through the downs even when you've had tremendous success behind you. Um, how I Built This is a podcast by Guy Raz on NPR. I love it. And I think that was the inspiration behind me starting Digitales for our market because I was like, this is a great podcast, but it's so US focused. What if we did this with entrepreneurs, with successful people in our market? And um, that was honestly the source of inspiration for that. Um, what else is there? I have recently started dabbling with chat GPT. I have, the jury is still out on what I think about it. I'm a little confused by what AI is going to do to our digital space and what value we will continue creating for our clients um, on the media front, on the creative front. So no opinion yet, still playing with it. Um, during COVID, we went and experimented with all of the uh, tools like Slack and Basecamp and, um, you know, uh, Trello and 
I think there was one more movie, Asana, Jira. And I think Trello is the one we've settled with. I'm a fan of that. It puts everything in front of all team members. You always are aware of who's got what on their plate. Uh, strongly recommend that. And um, yeah, I would say that's that's about it. Strava, another app. It's become a favorite for me. What is that? Track, tracks your workouts. So it's basically a social platform for your workouts and people you work out with. So you're constantly looking at who's doing what, who's doing a run where, who's doing a bike where, you know, and then you're kind of motivating each other during that. I love that. You know, I'm going to check out several people have mentioned the surrender experiment and I haven't checked it out yet. So I have to. And then the book of joy I love. One of my favorites is the art of happiness, which is also Howard Cutler in the, in the Dalai Lama. So I'm gonna have to check out the book of joy as well. And, um, you know, Faisal, I just want to be the first one to thank you. Thank you for sharing your journey, <clears throat> your lessons. Everyone check out more episodes of the podcast. Check out eastriverdigital.com. Uh, thanks, Faison. Thanks, everyone. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like, like a beach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 